So welcome. This is our fourth, count them four, session of Journalism Under Seas, Truth and Trust in a Time of Turmoil. I'm Don Garcia, director of the John S. Knight Journalism Fellowships Program here at Stanford and co-host of this course with Michael Bolden, who is the managing director uh, for communications at the JSK Fellowships. The speaker, this speaker series is a collaboration with the Continuing Studies Program here at Stanford and the John S. Knight Journalism Fellowships at Stanford. Each of the five nights is devoted to issues that are important to our program, the John S. Knight Fellowships, and to journalism. Tonight's class is focused on the state of local news. We think that's one of the most important sectors in the media that's supporting democracy. Here are some questions that we hope to answer tonight. Why is there an accelerated decline in the number and strength of local news organizations around the United States? What does this mean for our local communities? Where are there signs of hope? Will local news startups fill the void? And what does this mean for the state of our democracy? Failing business models and changing reader habits have decimated local news organizations in many communities. Legacy news organizations are still trying to adapt to a changing media landscape, and new business models are emerging to try to fill those gaps. Tonight, we've invited journalists and media experts who are going to provide a variety of unique perspectives on this topic. The first part of the evening will be a conversation about local legacy news media with Ken Doctor, a news industry analyst, Neil Chase, executive editor of the San Jose Mercury News, Bay Area News Group, and Fernando Diaz, managing editor for digital of the San Francisco Chronicle. They will talk both about some trends in local news as well as what's happening on the ground at two major news organizations right here in the Bay Area. We'll take a short break after the first session. Our second panel tonight will focus on some innovative models in local journalism. Our guests for that panel will be Sue Cross, CEO of the Institute of Nonprofit News, Chris Horn, a 2019 JSK Fellow and founder and publisher of The Devil Strip in Akron, Ohio, Jaquanda Johnson, founder and publisher of Flint Beat in Flint, Michigan, and Clay Lambert, editor of the Half Moon Bay Review here in the Bay Area. As we do every evening, we invite you to write your questions on index cards and pass them to the left of the auditorium to the talented and lovely Erica Bartholomew. Raise your hand, Erica. There she is. She'll collect them for you throughout the evening, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of each session. Friendly last reminder that the full syllabus for this course is on Canvas and the course website, along with biographical information for all of the speakers. We've posted books and uh, articles and such for you there, and we've been doing that all along throughout the course. And there are now a few audio recordings up there of, a f of our classes. I want to just quickly introduce just a bit more our three panelists that are on stage right now, and then let's get to it. To my immediate left is Neil Chase. He's the executive editor at the Bay Area News Group and the San Jose Mercury News. A veteran journalist and marketer with deep experience in print and digital, he got his start at the San Francisco Examiner. And the t then he was at a Russian American newspaper startup. Uh, and he was at a, did a stint as professor at Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism and a number of other places, the New York Times included. And he's worked as a consultant to media and business properties seeking to invigorate their content offerings in a digital age. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan where he now chairs the school's board for student publications. And we were just sharing our love of student publications a minute ago. To, uh, to Neil's left is Ken Doctor. He's a media analyst, speaker, and consultant. His work centers on the transformation of consumer media in the digital age from the New York Times to Netflix, from Comcast to Condé Nast. He's a veteran of the digital media industry, combines deep experience as an executive in strategy, revenue models, and journalism. And he's had experience including 21 years at Knight Ritter, where I used to work years ago, and his um, time also licensing, corporate development, business development, and syndication. He writes uh, a great column, which a number of us read. 
His major non-work commitment is to education and improving life in Santa Cruz County where he lives. He's past president of the UC Santa Cruz Foundation and he's a graduate of US, UCSC and a volunteer for many years for that university. And on the far left, not, not least, is Fernando Diaz, who's the managing editor for digital of the San Francisco Chronicle. Before joining the Chronicle, he was the senior editor for Reveal at the Center for Investigative Reporting. And before that, managing editor of OI in Chicago, and also the Chicago Tribune. He was, uh, earlier before that, he worked at Chicago Now as their community manager and a bilingual investigative reporter at the Chicago Reporter, and also local reporter at the Daily Herald and Democrat and Chronicle. So he's got a lot of local news creds. He's a graduate of Columbia College, Chicago, and he's a Maryland native and now lives in the Bay Area. So without further ado, we're gonna hear about legacy local news. Take it away. Thank you. So we're gonna start with a quiz. I feel like I could ask the quiz. This looks like Alexa right here. I could ask Alexa a question. <laughs> I don't know what we would get. So uh, we had one gentleman over here. You wanna hold up your newspaper. There, uh, we were watching who, we had, wh how, who was reading what. Everybody was on electronic. And you got the Stanford Daily. This should be a door prize. Is there a door prize for you? <laughs> <laughs> so let's try, let's try a little audience participation to start out with. How many, oh, the number two. Okay, number anybody three. else? Well, three, four, this is very good. Five, six, <laughs> this is very good. This is a good warm, and seven. Wait, is that a newspaper? New York. Oh, the New Yorker, that, that's good enough. Close enough. Yeah, that's good enough. <laughs> also doing very well in, in digital subscription. How many of you, just raise your hands, how many of you subscribe to the New York Times? Woo. Okay, how many of the Washington Post? How many both? Oh, that's good. That's good. Now, how many of you have either the New York Times or Washington Post app on your phone? That's interesting. Okay, now we'll go local for a moment here. How many of you subscribe to the Chronicle? <laughs> we're, we're getting, that's a good question. That's a great question. Like, there's 14 versions, right? That's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Chron Chronicle again, one more time. A lot of people, okay. You. I do. The company pays for it though, right? No. No? I live in San Francisco. <laughs> oh, that's right. Uh, the Mercury News. Okay. So if all of America looked like this, we would have no problems. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Um, how many of you have the Chronicle app or icon on your phone? Okay. So that's good. <laughs> how many have a Mercury News icon or app? Okay. About the same number. Okay. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad. So I'm going to start by talking a little about... Which? The Kindle, the Kindle version. Oh, the Kindle version. We could do in Kindle. We could do e-edition. Um, okay. Kindle version of the Chronicle. <laughs> <laughs> Kindle version of the Mercury News. <laughs> nope. <laughs> uh, e-edition. Anybody read the e-edition of these papers? So our numbers tell us about 25% of people who get the newspaper in print also read the e-edition. It looks like about a quarter of the people in the room. So yep. that's... Pretty representative. And that means they actually spent, you know how much time they spend, or that means they open it up? So people who go to the e-edition look at a lot of pages. Often it's done on, a, on an iPad or, or a tablet or um, sometimes on the phone, but a lot of tablet users, it's so easy to flip through the pages. You know, we, we count page views online with the number of pages somebody sees. And it's one thing to go to your computer and look at a page, then click and go to another page. But on, a, on the e-edition, you can just flip through the pages. Same thing with the app. And so the page view numbers are off the charts, but they're not really comparable. Mm -hmm. Same so, thing. Same, same thing. thing, yep. The uh, e-edition, uh, which is one of the things that I wanted to improve when I got there uh, yeah. every year and a half ago, and we do every day make sure that all of the articles get to the Kindle edition. 
Um, just for you. Just for you. <laughs> um, uh, well, because it begets a, qu a question and conversation later about platforms. Yeah. Right. And just how many places we absolutely need to be, yeah, to be at all times. Um, but our e-edition is among the most engaged products we produce. Um, and the, the, the push and the pull now is that um, we already have those customers. And so the question becomes, well, do we convert new customers into e-edition customers, or do we convert them into website customers, or do we get them into the newsletters? And there's a lot of friction around whether you want more e-edition customers or you want to migrate those folks into the website, the full right. featured experience. But you said something about when you, we're just going to run this conversation, you can just yeah, sit there. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> you said something about when you got there, you want to make the e-edition better. Yeah. The e-edition has such potential because Tremendous. it's an unlimited number of pages. If you get the Sacramento Bee, I want to ask how many Sacramento Bee subscribers there are. If you get the Sacramento Bee and you get their e-edition, along with it, you get a 50-page supplement every day that has all kinds of other stuff that wouldn't fit in the paper. Full business uh, stock tables, full sports scores, all the kind of stuff because they can do it company-wide, the McClatchy Company across the country. It's one of those things where it's not that hard to do, and the e-edition's a wonderful place to do it because people like to engage deeply the other the other thing and again yeah ken you can just back yes, off. Uh, no, the, the other thing is that the e-edition yeah. um still uh is the tangible representation of the editor's decisions on news and they are not driven by what clicks on the page right so you know m most of my favorite stories are on a3 b4 yeah. Um, you yep. know and i think that a lot of readers will find that they're the stories that didn't have the necessary art or they weren't newsy enough for a cover, but they're still important enough to include in the in the in the paper. So you don't so like the, your editor's choices for, for the for the front for the, page. For the, yeah. quite <laughs> saying that, but you could intuit that. Yeah. I want to step back for a moment and talk about reader revenue a little and how important all your subscriptions are. So if you if you look at reader revenue, if you go back to 2010, um, there were some people in a place called Silicon Valley that said that the internet wants to be free, remember that, and that all news would always be free on the internet because that's the way God wanted it to be. 2011, the New York Times started planning a, what they called, uh, what the industry has mistakenly called a paywall, uh, meaning a subscription, um, and in 2011, uh, later, it was launched. Since then, about 65% of daily newspapers in the United States have paywalls. And so they're saying basically that interim between when basically 95, 96, 98, and the 2012, 2013, kind of forget about that. We kind of made a mistake by giving away all this content for free and have said to all of you, what counts is the content, not the means of delivery. And a lot of people have accepted that. Now, you can see from the hands in the audience exactly the, the, the nature of the problem. Uh, far, many, far more people here taking the Times or the Post than taking the local paper. And this is the problem across the United States. If you look at the numbers, the New York Times in particular, which I've written a lot about, now has about 3.8 million subscribers between print and digital, more digital than print now. At the height of, of, of print, it was less than half of that. So what they've done is they've used all of what has changed to their advantage. It's still not a thriving business, but it is a business that is transitioning and making it. Uh, similar Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, these national global papers. On the other hand, throughout the country, and the same thing is true in Europe, and basically the Western world, local papers have a hard time selling digital subscriptions. They have their print subscriptions, they're declining as all print subscriptions are even at the, the Post and the Times. So this is a core problem and the, the economics of it is important for everybody here who is interested in this to know. The New York Times now gets two thirds of its revenue from its readers. You think of the importance of this and especially in the times we live in politically and this is the direct connection between the journalists and their readers. It's not advertisers, it's journalists and readers, two thirds. Most daily newspapers about still maybe somewhere between 30 and 40% is, is circulation. The rest is still advertising. We all grew out of a world where all these newspapers when they were thriving 
dependent on advertising for 80% of the revenue. So that whole world is flipped. The national people have made a transition and the, the local people are still trying to figure it out. So I wanna to go to that question with both of you and talk about what you're doing in digital subscription consequently with that kind of framework of what are you doing and how, how, much, is this, how much is changing how quickly? It's changing uh, incredibly quickly. And, and describe your parent company, Hearst. So I, I work for the Chronicle, and uh, we are owned by the Hearst Corporation, which owns everything from ranches to uh, health information companies to the books that your mechanic uses to estimate how much it's going to cost to change a ball joint. Um, so they're a hyper-diversified private corporation, and newspapers are just one portion of it. Um, I would say also that uh, we are behind the magazine division. Uh, the magazine division of Hearst is massive, um, and they are far advanced in the subscription game. They are far advanced in the digital game, um, in the uh, advertorial, um, uh, uh, sort of the sponsored links game, right. um, where they'll do uh, links to products, where they do reviews. They're not affiliated, but if you buy lipstick or a, a, a garden hose, then they get a portion of that revenue. So what we're doing is we're desperately trying to catch up because on some level, there is a limit to the number of people that we could theoretically consider converting into paying digital customers. And for every- A limit because geographically, you have a much smaller base than say the New York Times. That's right. And even, even though on any given day, we get a substantial amount of traffic, what I call the hate reads, uh, the drudge you know, audience, the yeah. far right audience that just loves to hate uh, this entire state, um, but specifically our publication uh, for many things we publish day in and day out. Mostly because the name is San Francisco. Yes. Yeah. Nancy yeah. Pelosi's hometown. That's right. right. Um, the pastel condos. So that's, <laughs> that's traffic, I think, in a classic sense that five years ago, we would have been counting and saying, we need to drive those page views, we need to get those impressions up, and we would have been counting drudge traffic as a good thing, because it means that there's, there's audience for that. We've evolved into understanding that it's very unlikely that we're going to convert a drudge reader into a paying subscriber. And so we need to pivot our editorial strategy to focus more on the needs and the interests of what Bay Area, what California readers primarily are interested in because our data shows that you're much more likely to become a paying subscriber if you're geographically proximate to us. Now let me stop you there for a minute and go and, and then pick it up. So what Fernando is describing is, is what's happened throughout the industry. When he says five years ago, you're looking for page views, meaning you want, you want, and remember all these slideshows that you saw when you got on your phone and all this kind of stuff, you want, they wanted you to consume as many pages as possible so they can put as many ads in front of you. Google and Facebook have won the digital ad war. The, the value of all those page views has declined. And, and as that's happened, what's, what, what Fernando's talking about in terms of the importance of the readers, and, and look at this in terms of, so now it's important to really serve well a smaller number of real readers mm -hmm. who care about the news and if you can get them to pay for it you've got a lifeline for the future right and so that's what that's that's the larger mechanics that's going on really all over the western world now describe a little about uh, Hearst we talked about this in terms of uh, the databases what kind of information do you know about the, the people who are your your readers here for instance and how do databases yeah. and repositories work so if you're and this is a, it can be a little scary uh, depending on how much you don't know about what's being tracked um, but literally we know what device you're on um, what time of day you come to the site what stories you read um, how long you were on those stories whether you shared them um, how far you scrolled on those stories, what browser you're using, um, to some degree what uh, cell service provider you have. Um, we know uh, general geographic information based on your IP address. Um, and depending on, you know, we've moved from what was the industry standard Omniture uh, analytics platform into Google Analytics, which offers us now uh, demographic information that is gathered based on all of the cookies 
that are put into your browser by all of the sites that you actually are on in addition to news. So we now know that if you're into sports or you're into food or you're into videos, we don't necessarily know that it's Bob Smith who lives at 1234 Main Street uh, in Half Moon Bay. Um, but we know that there's a user of this sort of like um, a cohort persona. of people like that. Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah. And so that's what uh, uh, Ken was describing. We will then use that information to say, okay, if they're in this geographic area and they come to our website about three times a week and we've got them on email, can we convert them into a print subscriber, into a print or a digital, ideally a digital subscriber because we don't have the added cost of distributing the newspaper? Um, then that's what we're looking for. We are looking through all of our data to identify the convertibles, the people that will, that are, that can be compelled into supporting our ability to do journalism. And that changes the marketing offer. So you may all get different offers based on the information that's, right. that's in that database, both, uh, and pr the price could change. Um, you may be offered uh, newsletters. How many of you rece receive an email newsletter from a, newspaper or magazine every day. So these, these have turned out to be the major way that publishers are now reaching directly and not just through Google and Facebook readers. You're signaling that intent, the newsletters are free, that information goes in the database. Chronicle, for instance, does a really uh, good job and a smart job around food, food and dining and wine, and that is one significant part of it. Let me turn to Neil, and, 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 and so I know you've started uh, your own unit uh, in terms of uh, digital subscriptions, um, and using a Knight Fellow, I believe. Ex explain what you're doing and why. Yeah, so as, as Fernando explained, he's part of the Hearst Corporation, and you've all seen Hearst Castle, and remember the, the movies, and the Hearst, I worked at the San Francisco Examiner in the 80s, where <laughs> Will Hearst III was the publisher, right? This is a family that's been in the media business forever, and, and hopes to stay in the media business forever. Um, we're in a different situation. We are owned by an investment firm, uh, better known as a hedge fund, and there's some worse names for it, uh, on the East Coast, that is very much interested in the current cash flow. Newspapers, because of all of our wonderful subscribers, we generate a lot of revenue now, and that money is a very nice kind of cash machine for the owners. They're far less interested in actually investing in the future. And so some of the tools that Hearst has, the work that Hearst has done as a corporation, to move all of their papers across the country forward. We're doing that ourselves in the Mercury News newsroom. And so there's a, a gentleman who was a reporter for the Associated Press, was part of the Knight Fellowship program here, spent his time here researching subscription models and how, how subscribers will support journalism in the future. And he's now working with us, leading that effort in our newsroom. Um, and we, we are trying to strike that balance between doing the stories that we know are the most important stories to do, the stories that we have to do as journalists that are important to serve our role in, in, in a functioning democracy or a semi-functioning democracy these days, right. as best we can, yeah. um, and doing the stories people want to read. And there are fascinating conversations in the newsroom about, well, I need to go do this story. I've got to co cover this meeting. And, well, but nobody reads that. Well, but it's really important. Yeah, but if nobody reads it, was it really important? When we put stories in the newspaper, we think we know what people want to read. Mm -hmm. And every reporter will tell you, every story I wrote that was on the front page was read by every single person who got the newspaper that day. Because of course they all got the newspaper to read my story. In fact, many of us had the experience of picking up a newspaper and going straight to, let's say, the crossword puzzle or the movie listings or whatever else. We all use newspapers in different ways. When you start publishing online, you really understand what people want to read and what they want more of. And so it doesn't mean we only write the stupid celebrity stories. We do those because they bring a lot of people in. Um, but we do try to focus on the kinds of stories people really want to read and the stories that the data tells us people want to read and they react to. We do a newsletter every day that gives you a complete, it gives you the sense of somebody sitting down next to you on the bus or on BART or at a coffee shop and walking you through all the day's news. Uh, and we strongly believe that the newsletter is the closest thing we have now to the old print newspaper. If you don't get a print newspaper dropped on your front porch every day, the most analogous thing we can do to that is dropping a newsletter in your email box that tells you what's going on in the newspaper. So we are 
within the newsroom, trying to build an understanding of what people want to read, giving people more of those kinds of stories, and it's causing us to invest in more investigative reporters, in more regional stories. We, this will come as a shock to everybody, but we found out that nobody in the Bay Area ever has a conversation that is not about housing prices <laughs> and how expensive it is to live here and all the trailers and RVs, and I don't have to tell you, you live here. Um, and are you finding, like, on the investigative stuff, that that leads to subscriptions? Have you figured that out yet? We are starting to. We, we, we've benefited from being very close to a lot of other publishers and sharing a lot of information. The, the competition in this business is pretty much gone. We share a lot of information with each other. We have to. And we've learned from a lot of other folks who are ahead of us in this process that they've seen a, a, a good increase in subscriptions from investigative. A lot of news organizations are growing their investigative units. We're, we do see that the local stories that have some impact do draw more subscriptions, and we're just starting to bring in a bunch of new I people want, and kind I of wrap that up. I wanted to bring that up because I've heard from publishers around the country that as they look at the data, it is that kind of reporting and lo longer stories and stories that are absolutely unique to, to their publication that they can now associate. Neil says, you can track everything. Fernando described how you track it. it, it and look at the good news, the, the small piece of good news in that, that there are people who care about that and that links to their money, which goes to paying journalists. And there's a bigger piece of good news in that. Yeah. For 20 years, people in the newsrooms have sat there and That's watched right. the business collapse. Um, you remember shopping at Mervyn's and Circuit City and Levitt's Furniture and Toys R Us and Sports Authority, and I could go on and on and on. How old are you? I'm old. I remember. Um, I was at Wells Fargo when it was founded. <laughs> the, the, um, as those businesses collapsed, the good. Sunday paper got smaller, right, considerably. Those ads aren't there anymore. There was a time when if you wanted to find out what was playing at the movie theater, you either called up the theater or you picked up the newspaper. We would sneak into the composing room at the Examiner in the 80s to try to see the classified listings for apartments the night before the paper got printed to get a jump on finding an apartment in San Francisco because it was hard. It's still hard. So that monopoly is gone, right? There are many other places to get that information. News journalists for the last 20 years have watched the business just shrink around us. And now we can say to the journalists, if we do stories people want to read, they will pay for them, and that will be a business that is sustainable long-term and will support the journalism that we're trying to do. And that's a big emotional change. It's a big deal. So tell, me, tell them what Ryan's up to. Uh, Ryan, the guy who was the, uh, the uh, Knight Fellow here, um, is building a digital subscription business for us with help in the newsroom um, based on understanding how people behave online, um, and how different kinds of people are more likely to subscribe. So one of his, one of his areas of interest is, is ad blockers. A lot of people use software on their, on their uh, websites that block the ads, which is okay. Um, but if you're using an ad blocker, we ask you to subscribe, because now you're not seeing any ads and you're not paying us for the content. Um, and so we're building specialized ways, all, all sites, our Hearst does it as well, where if you're using an ad blocker, we invite you in a different way to subscribe, maybe more quickly than we would if you were seeing some of the ads. Um, we're doing an event tomorrow night in Oakland to talk about housing issues with the community, and he's going to be there to understand how the community interacts with us and start to learn how the people who are closest to the issues we cover consume the news and in what ways they're most likely to want to support us and subscribe. So you can see this common thread here, and this is going on throughout the industry. And Hearst basically, maybe two years ago, committed significant resources in New York to figuring this out for their mm -hmm. newspapers. Neil's figuring this out for Bay Area and what, and what they're doing here. And when I go and talk to the Financial Times in London, they were the ones, actually New York Times copied their paywall for the Financial Times. They figured this out in the early 2000s. And, and the whole area is called propensity modeling. How likely is each of you to subscribe and figuring that out. Now, let's move to a little larger frame here and to some of the questions that Don raised, which are the pivotal questions about community, country, democracy. So if we look at overall what this change has meant, we've had huge decline in advertising. The decline in advertising is beyond belief. $30 billion a year less goes into the daily newspaper coffers than it did uh, well, now 12 years ago, $30 billion a year. So the, the industry is 60% uh, downsized. At the same time, 
Uh, Neil mentioned all of the all the cash that flows through the newspapers. It's not just cash; it's profits. So the profits, of, and I'm just running down this number, and it's an imprecise number today, but somewhere between a billion and a billion and a half dollars in free cash flow, basically profits, flow out of American newspapers still today. 1,200 newspapers left, about 100 dailies have gone away over the last decade, but they're producing a billion and a billion and a half dollars in profit. Even though the readership, the print readership is dropping five to 10% a year, struggling very, very much on print advertising, and digital, digital subscription is slow to take off. So what we're seeing too much, and unfortunately Neil's parent company is the, the poster child for it, is what's called harvesting. It turns out that in an industry that throws off a billion dollars, you can harvest a lot of money for a long time. And people, and I've written about this too much, I think, but uh, pe people, uh, people didn't understand that there are a lot of businesses that just do that they find declining industries. So what we now have, and we had a report coming out, came out last, uh, last uh, Monday, or a week ago Monday, from Penny Abernathy at the University of North Carolina, who has coined the term uh, news desert and also ghost newspapers. And she talked about in that, in that report that just out that there are now 1,500 communities that have lost substantial news that there are 1,800 newspapers that have closed since 2004, 1,700 of them weeklies. And then there's this map. If you go to, uh, just put news deserts into uh, Google, you'll see the map. And the map shows wide swaths of the country where there is only maybe one newspaper in an entire county, that's often a weekly, and there are a whole bunch of places where there's no newspapers left at all. Now we can kind of see the results of, of, of that in, in the democracy. But if we, if we look at the Bay Area, it's a very interesting question. We have here, uh, we have one of the most affluent, educated audiences in, in the world. And yet, in many of these communities, because resources have been limited, there are news deserts. So let's talk about coverage and what, what that means in terms of, Anil brought up, the choices that you now have to make. Uh, the staffs of these newspapers are far smaller than they used to be. The industry is not only downsized 60% in revenue, but 60% in newsroom staff ac across, across the, the country. About 24,000 people work in daily newsrooms, that's it. And, um, and that, that number was as high as 56,000 in 1990. And we have 70 million more people. So this, has been, this is a bigger problem. Uh, talk about, a little about uh, your resources and the kind of choices that you have to make. Yeah. Well, I would say, I mean, I, I appreciate you sharing those stats because they're true and they are alarming. Yeah. Um, you know, back in 1990, it was the newspaper. That's what you right. had to publish. Now it's an incessant news cycle that's 24-7, doesn't let up, it's led by Washington, it's led by climate, it's led by California, it's led by Sacramento. Um, and so you do have a much smaller newsroom at a time when the platforms are multiplying and the ways in which people are expecting their news. Now it's not just the Kindle, they want audio, right? They wanna be able to listen to their news. At some point they're gonna ask their refrigerator, play me the Chronicle, right? And we need to figure that out because we need to be there or we'll need to be there in some shape. That's right. And we can't go and cleave a portion of our newsroom to start an audio division, right? So we've got to find sort of the, what we like to call or don't like to call in the newsroom is just working in the margins. Yeah. So we try to figure out like, hey, that guy two jobs ago was at a radio station. You know, that gal over there, she cool. did newsletter management at her other job. And what, what can she tell us about how we can cobble together new workflows, re-engineer our processes so that we can still create what we would consider to be that polished, best-in-class newspaper experience for the folks who are paying top dollar for it, while at the same time being able to populate what feels like an infinite number of new channels 
and at the same time still both meet our own journalistic ambition and responsibility by covering the news. And the, and the Chronicle staff's probably been reduced. I don't know the numbers of the Chronicle. Maybe by half? Yeah, we're at 173, 178 right now. It was over 400 at its height. Yeah. It's more so, than half. More than half. And so you can see all the, all the challenges there. That's just a, 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 a quick perspective of the kind of challenges of having to do more. And then, of course, you could say, well, just do the reporting. But through digital channels, you have to feed all of these kinds of products. And uh, audio, <laughs> Fernando said, you know, we like to have an audio unit. The New York Times, well, it, it's, it got to where it needed to be. How many of you listen to the Daily podcast? Now, this is only maybe a year and a quarter old at this yeah. point. Amazing penetration. They didn't know that it was going to become a major part of what they're doing. The last count, they have 18 people working in audio. Yeah. So they recognize that now, Fernando recognized the same thing, that the uh, our, our Alexa smart speaker friend here will be telling us the news in five years. We know that's going to happen in some way because it's so easy. But if you're so re resource constrained, you you the, the businesses are in a downward spiral. Even though you've got editors like this and many incredibly hardworking journalists who know what to do, but they simply don't have enough resources to do it. Tell, tell us about the kind of choices that you've had to make as uh, you've been in your job, I'm guessing, almost two years. Two and a half years. Two and a half years. It just feels like three. <laughs> um, we make a lot of choices every day, right? We, uh, we, have, we have made some choices to stop doing some things. You have to do that in order to focus on the things you're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, we made a deal with our friends at the Sacramento Bee. They have a lot more people in the state capitol than we do, uh, understandably. Not just in the Sacramento newsroom, but they have a capitol bureau in, in the state capitol uh, with like six or eight people. They have two people in their Washington bureau. They cover state politics better than we do. Um, we have a bigger sports desk than they do, and a lot of people in Sacramento follow the Bay Area sports teams. And so the editor and I were talking, and we said, you know what, let's just trade. Take all my sports stuff you want, do whatever you want with it. I'm going to take all your politics stuff, do whatever I want with it. There's no contract, there's no terms, there's no signatures or dollars. It's just, let's help each other out, right? Let's share some things. Um, so in some cases, we make a choice to share with somebody rather than doing it ourselves. Um, we have 30 weekly papers around the Bay Area. They are, in some cases, things that we started. In some cases, they were things that we acquired over the years. The Bay Area News Group is a collection of what used to be probably 20 different news organizations. Yeah. It's the Oakland Tribune, the Contra Costa Times, the San Mateo County Times, the Mercury News, and a bunch of other publications, all kind of the Marin Independent Journal. We're down to three papers now, the East Bay Times, the Mercury News, and the Marin Independent Journal. Um, and those 30 weeklies, they have a lot of stories in them. And those of you who are looking at me with a scowl right now are the ones who get that weekly every week <laughs> and don't find much from your community in it anymore because we don't have the level of community coverage we used to have. There are 101 cities, towns in the Bay Area, in the nine county Bay Area. There are 400 plus jurisdictions, city councils, school boards, water districts, sanitation districts, special this and that districts, um, sheriff's departments, police departments. To cover all those agencies the way we used to, we can't do it anymore. And so we've made some tough choices about doing more regional stories. The housing beat we created is covering the housing, not just housing in general and home prices, but one particular story, which is that for every 10 new tech jobs in the Bay Area, we've created one new housing unit in the past decade. Wow. That leads to everything we all experience every day, from the traffic to people who take a two and a half hour train ride from Tracy and Stockton to come work in, in San Jose, to the people in the RVs and things that you see around here, um, to people making $100,000 a year, 40 year old people living together in houses the way college students live, lived. Um, and college students can't even afford to live anywhere in our campus, right? So we, we made a choice to cover that story intensively because it touches so many different areas of, of equity, of renting and owning and immigration issues and traffic and infrastructure and education uh, at the expense of a lot of other things. We don't cover many of the large companies in the Bay Area anymore. We don't cover the earnings of most of the big companies. Lots of other people do that. You don't need us to do that. Um, we need to take our limited resources, relatively limited. You're going to hear from some people in the next session who have far smaller newsrooms than we do and do 
more amazing work in their communities that we can only aspire to be able to do, to do as well as they do. But with the size of team we have, we make decisions every day about which things to cover, how to cover something that's a regional interest, skipping something local, picking up something national from somebody else. Uh, and th they're tough choices. We'd like to cover more of it, but you've got to figure, you've got to make some decisions about what's A, most important, and B, most likely to drive people to subscribe so we have the revenue to keep covering things. Well, let me ask you, and let me ask Don to bring up some questions. I see we have a lot of good questions, so just bring them up any time and um, ask you both a question off of that. So, uh, smaller staff, a lot of choices need to be made, uh, many, many, too many choices. Mm -hmm. uh, makes a lot of sense, the kind of regional orientation, and I know you're doing the same thing. Um, what about the smaller startups that you see? Berkeley side is one that's gotten a lot of recognition. Mm -hmm. There are a number of smaller ones in the Bay Area and across the country. A lot of them, uh, I think Berkeley side has maybe a half a dozen people full time. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and some, uh, and, and, and Sue is on the next uh, panel from INN. Uh, uh, lots of organizations that incredibly dedicated journalists, small staffs. How much do you see that going on in the Bay Area? And can, can you see a, a world in which those proliferate and you connect with them? Is that, is that happening in your view? Is, is, should it happen? What do you think? You, wanna, I mean, you, you guys have a good partnership with Berkeley You guys side, have right? done a lot of, yeah. and you've done more, uh, we, more regional pro projects that, too. Yeah, and I, I would say that the, the, the better partnership is with CalMatters now. Mm -hmm. we're, we're publishing a lot of CalMatters stuff, which to Neil's point about partnering with the Sacramento Bee, our choice was to go with CalMatters, which is a- And let me ask the audience, how many of you know, recognize the name CalMatters? So relatively few, four or five. Describe, yeah. describe what it is. So Cal Matters is a nonprofit, nonpartisan. Uh, I, are they watchdog? Are they policy oriented? But they're basically doing a lot of policy coverage in Sacramento that, as Neil described, has just sort of fallen away. Mm -hmm. um, as um, as everybody has pulled bureaus. Paired them, paired them down. Um, but they also um, have a Creative Commons open copyright policy where they want to share their content. Yeah. They want to get more reach for their journalism and so they offer it for free. Um, and so our, uh, my counterpart in print, Michael Gray, works very closely with the folks at Cal Matters to coordinate publishing their stories in the Chronicle. That. Um, so that's been one way. Um, I would say my personal opinion yeah. is that um, uh, Berkeley Side, uh, Double Strip, um, you know, Flint Beat, that's the future. The question is, what's after that? Do, do those smaller news organizations band together to form the regional infrastructure necessary to do larger swings like what Neil's describing? like what uh, Audrey Cooper led right. with the Homeless Project, right? Because they are small, right? And, and by necessity have to focus on uh, topics that they can tackle, but they can also partner, right? And you'll hear from Sue about how I and mm -hmm. news, newsrooms do that. And you have a model in yeah. Panama Papers and ICIJ of doing this at a massive scale. The question is just, how do you do how it organizationally? It and who do does you, it, right? So when, it? when when his boss, Audrey Cooper, reached out to papers all, and news organizations all around the Bay Area and said, let's all cover homelessness on the same day, it was a brilliant idea and it got a lot of people talking about homelessness all on the same day. Um, we have failed time and time again over the past 20 years in the large media company world to be the leaders in making new things happen. Mm -hmm. And if we fail again, it will be because organizations like the Mercury News go away and smaller startups have to scramble and fill the hole, yeah. as opposed to saying, look, we are the largest news organization in the South Bay, but we're no nowhere near as large as we used to be. So we need to partner more aggressively. Professor Craig's here from, from San Jose State. The Spartan Daily has a wonderful staff of editors and reporters who are far more diverse than the people in my newsroom and touch every part of the community in the San Jose area. We should be using them as part of our news gathering, mm -hmm. right? Berkeley side, all the other startups, small organizations, bloggers, the more we reach out and partner with those folks, the more we create sort of a news ecosystem that supports everybody. Absolutely. And we help, let's, let's reach out to people who are doing a strong, good job of community journalism and help them do it, 
rather than sit here and expect it all to go away or somehow, you know, we're gonna die if we don't find a new way to, 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 to rebuild our business. And by the way, we're gonna die before the Chronicle does because they have a real owner. Um, <laughs> yes, this is on the record, I don't care. Um, and it's, it's very possible that the Chronicle will end up being a Bay Area-wide newspaper if we, if we become too small. Right. But the, the better idea, right, is to have an ecosystem in the Bay Area where a bunch of journalists at all different levels, local and regional, expert and amateur, student and veteran professional, are all doing journalism all day long to get the best report we can for the Bay Area. And what I would just add to that is one of the things that you do see in an organization like Berkeley Side is that innovation toward membership, toward engagement, that companies of the size that Neil and I work at, there's a lot of layers of bureaucracy, you know, so I give him a lot of credit for hiring to build that uh, infrastructure in his own newsroom. But whichever way it goes, the Chronicle will not have six people covering Berkeley ever again. And neither will the Merck, or neither will the East Bay Times. That's right. So that's something that we also have to embrace. It's competitively, collaboratively, how do, it's about the journalism, you know? It's not about beating each other. It's not about beating Berkeley side. It's about ensuring that we are holding power to account. And if Berkeley side broke that story, then, it, then we should give them that credit. Um, but we should also help amplify that story Get because it out to we lots of have people. the audience that they don't have because we reach so many more readers than they do. Yeah. For now. So you see, I mean, you see here, and this is happening basically in every metropolitan area around the country. So a lot of smaller communities, depending on who their owners are, are even in worse shape. Um, and so you have a system that worked for so well, especially since World War II. Um, and the power of that, of that essentially monopoly daily and, and the reporting power it had was amazing. And the ability to have at least a couple people in Berkeley and mm -hmm. people covering a lot of the institutions, <clears throat> so the 101 cities. Um, it, it is broken. Um, there are pieces being rebuilt. The pieces re being rebuilt are maybe one-tenth of what was lost, and they're not connected. And that's kind of a snapshot of what, what you're hearing is this is going on across the U.S., and amazingly, our smart Canadian friends have it even worse. They have one other hedge fund that bought all the newspapers across all the provinces, and it has treated them uh, very poorly. Let me get to a couple of questions here. Um, so, no, I like this one. No offense to anyone in the audience, but this group, group skews older. Sm smiley face. <laughs> I never see anyone under, under 40 reading a physical newspaper. When do you expect the physical paper to disappear? Have you looked at that? You've anyone yeah. looked at that question? Yeah. So. Um, there is a principle in making change happen in an organization that I'm going to mangle because business professors talk about it. It's over my head. But the basic idea is that you scare the crap out of people and then you show them a solution, right? Dissatisfaction, vision, and plan equals change. Um, when I got to my newsroom two and a half years ago, a lot of people who've been working there for a long time didn't know how small our circulation is now compared to what it used to be. Didn't know that the East Bay Times circulates more copies than the Mercury News. Didn't know about a lot of the changes that have happened in the industry. The, the data just wasn't shared with them and they've been there for a long time just doing their thing. So I said, look, the first thing we have to understand is where we are. And I built a very simple chart. The circulation of the Mercury News and East Bay Times together, the two papers, plotted over the past, I think, eight or 10 years. It has gone down every year. The number of copies goes down every year because this person's right. Nobody under 40 reads a print newspaper, very few people. Um, they read them on campus because you're in a concentrated place where you can pick up a print paper, which is great. I have a 21-year-old daughter who consumes more news every day than I do, but never reads a print paper. Um, we looked at the circulation and plotted it over the past eight or 10 years and just drew a line through that and through that line, the Mercury News in print is gone somewhere in the mid-2020s. There are no more print copies of the Mercury News. I don't know that that'll necessarily happen, at least on Sunday. I think we could sustain a good Sunday paper if it's a good weekly paper. Um, we just invested a bunch of money to upgrade our printing press. The Chronicle just took over their printing press and they're, they're running it from the company that used to run it. There's still a commitment to the printed newspaper. We're gonna do it as long as it's physically possible and feasible. 
The other thing that is hurting our circulation, not just the number of copies people are buying, is the trouble, the difficulty in distributing the newspaper, which to our surprise is becoming a bigger problem than, and those of you who have a lousy dis delivery service are, are nodding at this point. I'm just, sorry. Just email Neil if you didn't get your paper. Just email Ken. He'll take care of it. Um, our delivery service sucks in some areas. And if you think about it, a carrier gets paid a certain amount of money to deliver a newspaper to a house. It used to be us. We were kids, right, on our bicycles and wagons going around the neighborhoods. Every house in the paper got it. You could hit 100 papers within 10 blocks. Well, now there's maybe two houses on the block. And some of these blocks are giant subdivisions in the southern half of San Jose. That are, they're miles apart. It doesn't make economic sense to be a carrier anymore. And you can make a lot more money sitting in your air-conditioned car working for Uber and Lyft or working in the Amazon warehouse Absolutely. or whatever else. And so we're your, now sharing. Your, your guess is 2025? Mid-2025, mid, mid 2025, something like that. Wait, the product will be around longer. What do you think? I think that print, and this is the digital guy, um, but I think that print also is ready for a disruption. And a lot of the conversations that we're having, uh, you know, because our our deadlines keep getting earlier and earlier, right? Which means that ultimately you have This no is the next question. Let me add that okay. to your thinking as you answer that. Yeah. Um, why does the, the Merck and the Chronicle give me a, a news that is two days old? Right. So a, answer the deadline question. In yeah, there. So, so, so part of it, I would say, um, and, and I'm not going to try to dodge this question, because I think your concept of news is relative. Um, it's what, if it's what happened two days later, then absolutely that's old. But if it's why did that happen, what does it mean, what will it mean, that's a different context. And I think that right now, as Neil was describing the sort of like how we make our bets and how we resource, we break stuff on the web. And if we're publishing a story in the paper that ran on the web at 3 p.m. the day before, then, then then we're not doing our jobs, right? We're not editing. And I think that what we need to be doing is doing more analysis, more context, and that the newspaper is for reading. You think it'll stay seven days? I think that for a through long time? 2020, I think the paper will stay 2025? seven days. 2025? 2026? Uh, no, I think, I, think by, I think by 2025, um, well, we're heading into a recession, so we'll see. Maybe it's right. 2020, right? Um, because it's just, it's all hard cost. It's logistics. If the drivers don't want to carry it. No, li li listen to that. 2020, that is, <laughs> that is almost next year. Look, the, fa point, the fact right? that a recession is coming, I think a lot of people who, people who seem to know what they're talking about all think there's a recession coming. Yeah. That is going to hit hard in businesses that are already on the edge, the like ours, we're going to have a change. Hurt. Everybody in the Bay Area wants a recession to hit before the midterms. Right? Yeah, right? <laughs> so it's not here quite the, fast tar the, the tariffs, which have been on and off, and the tariffs on newsprint have hurt us. Uh, we're taking a big hit right now in the advertising related to H-1B visas. You, you want to bring somebody in from another country on an H-1B visa, you have to pl place, place an ad in the paper. Those ads are a lot of revenue to us. That's going away. There's a lot of change that's happening very quickly. And if we just sit here saying, gee, I hope the print paper goes on forever, we will be out of business. So the Boston Globe uh, is the most successful of all the regional newspapers at digital subscriptions. And tying back to what I was saying at the beginning, what we were discussing. They got about 100,000 digital subscriptions. And what they're doing is they are charging a uh, dollar a day. $365 a year for a digital subscription. By far I, uh, the, the highest I've heard. And the owner basically has said, he's a billionaire, John Henry, and he has said, it's the same content, we're doing a good job, we're doing all these products, and had really good people working the system. I have talked to the Globe, and I said, okay, what does it look like to you? Do you think, is, is print gonna go away? And do you want it to go away, right? <laughs> Because the question for, for all of us here and all of you isn't the paper as much as we may be attached to it and we like it, and of course the reporting and the content. Right. And so the question really is, and a lot of people ask that question in some form, um, will newspapers ever go away? When I'm, I'm asked that as an analyst, I say, have you looked at one lately? because it's a shadow of what it was, right? It's still physically printed, but look at the content. The Globe has looked at this question, 
and the globe would like print to go away. It is very, very expensive to print, truck, deliver, all of that, have a big building, pay all those salaries, and they would like it to go away. And so the exercise is, how do you keep the same number of people in the Globe newsroom uh, in a purely digital product? And their answer is, between 250 and 300,000 digital subscribers at about that current price, which mm -hmm. I would hope would go up at 365, could pay that newsroom. The company would be much smaller. <clears throat> now, they've done it. Some other companies have done that exercise. But as Fernando said, this could be, and we're seeing papers close this year. Gatehouse just closed seven papers in Missouri and Arkansas. And when the recession comes, whatever it is, we're going to see a real washout. But I think it's really important for us to focus on that question. And, it's, and it, this is a smart audience. And, and we, we know that you're all newspaper readers. You've got to be smart, right? This is the question of how do we maintain the reporting? It's gotten to such a point that there is an emergency declared within our industry. And there are people talking about a billion dollar fund here and a billion dollar fund there to fund, get more money into the industry, but there's no place to put it in a way that's going to sustain anything because the system today is broken. So it's a really interesting moment. I know we have to wrap up. I apologize for not getting to all these. We'd have another hour of questions. It would be good. But it's a really interesting moment, and, and, and Fernando and Neil have really given you a good portrait, I think, of on the ground, and as much as we get to in one hour, of the real challenges that they face and why the, the situation is so hard. But this is a national question, and it's now being approached nationally by some very wealthy and powerful people who see the threat to democracy and are trying to figure out what that new system, whether it's 2020, or 2025 might look like. And I would just urge you to participate in that thinking in any way that you can as we go forward. So thank you. Thank you. OK, good evening, and welcome back from your break. I'm Michael Bolden, one of the managing directors for the Knight Fellowships here at Stanford. Uh, in our first panel, we had a robust discussion uh, with two newsroom leaders uh, in legacy newsrooms adapting to the changing demands of the digital age. In this panel, we'll talk with four people involved in novel ways of sustaining local news organizations. I'll provide short introductions of our guests, but for more in-depth backgrounds, please visit Canvas, our online class platform, which has additional information on each of them, along with more information about their organizations. Um, also, as a reminder, if you have questions, um, Erica Bartholomew, our administrative director, is circulating index cards. Please raise your hand, and she'll be glad to collect uh, your questions. Um, so first, at my far right, we have Sue Cross, who is executive director and CEO of the Institute for Nonprofit News. That's a network of more than 180 news organizations that share best practices and training and collaborate on public service and investigative news stories. She is a former senior vice president of the Associated Press and served as AP's Los Angeles bureau chief. To my immediate right, we have Chris Horn. Chris is a 2019 JSK fellow and founder and publisher of The Devil Strip, an arts and culture magazine that focuses on connecting residents of Akron, Ohio to each other by sharing stories about what makes the city unique. Uh, and the devil strip, if you don't know, is a term used to refer to the space between tracks on a streetcar line or the no man's land between public and private property. To my immediate left, we have Jaquanda Johnson. Uh, Jaquanda is founder and publisher of Flint Beat, an online news publication that focuses on covering the city of Flint, Michigan. Um, she launched Flint Beat in March 2017 and she's worked for the Detroit News, NBC 25, Fox, and the M Live Media Group. At my far left, we have Clay Lambert. Clay has been a newspaper reporter and editor for more than 30 years. Since 2012, he has been editor of the Half Moon Bay Review, which has served coastal San Mateo County since 1898. Last spring, a group of community members bought the Half Moon Bay Review from the WIC Communications newspaper change. So that's our panel. Um, to quote Fernando from our last panel, he talked about uh, 
you know, some of these news organizations being the future. The future is now, so let's go there. <laughs> so first I'm going to turn to Sue Cross um, because she runs an organization called the Institute um, for Nonprofit News. Sue, what is nonprofit news? <laughs> what is this thing that we keep hearing about? So nonprofit news is one model of news that's, that's growing rapidly and it shows us some new possibilities around these economic tangles. Um, it isn't a substitute for running a news business. Nonprofits have to run as businesses like other businesses do. But what's happening around the country is that communities that have seen these cuts in their commercial news media or have lost any local media are forming their own news media. This is often journalists displaced from traditional media who are starting these up. But increasingly, we are hearing from business people, we are hearing from uh, community foundations, other community leaders calling saying, we have lost our news, can you help us figure out how to get something started? Uh, and this isn't just in the US, I just returned from a week in Canada with foundations and government officials and journalists looking at the same issue. The same discussions are happening throughout the UK and other countries as well. Um, so what distinguishes nonprofit news are a couple of things. You know, the biggest one that people go to right away is, well, you get donations. It's based on donations rather than selling things. And to some extent, that's true. The nonprofits we see around the country, and there's somewhere between 200 and 300 of them now, and their, their numbers are growing rapidly, that 90% the of their funding comes from philanthropy. So traditionally, that was foundations that gave them seed funding and started them. Increasingly, it's individual donors, people like you and me, and uh, wealthy individuals who decide to back these things. And that piece is growing. And then they also do, uh, they do do business. They hold events. They're very community-based. They um, get sponsorship. It's not so much like traditional advertising, but more like the sponsorship of programs you might hear on NPR, and they'll find other ways to make money as well, doing training and all kinds of things. So they're feeling their way toward different business models. So that's how they make money. The other thing that I would say really distinguishes nonprofit news is its ownership structure, because it's owned by the community, by law, the way it's structured, the public owns a nonprofit, and it's, it is founded on the basis that it's providing a public service and therefore gets a tax break. And that means it's much more difficult for a nonprofit that's essentially owned by the community and controlled by a board representing that community to fall subject to being taken over by an investor who might strip out those costs and that kind of thing. And that's the other reason I think you're seeing the model growing is the sense of a public trust and that it's a public good, like your library or hospitals and things like that. And uh, so that's the other foundational difference. Thank you, Sue. So um, Jaquanda Flintbeat is a member of the Institute for Nonprofit News um, and you're a relatively new organization. Um, can you talk to us about why you went that route um, and what you thought that being a nonprofit in Flint would mean for community news? I, if, I think I went that route because I do provide a public service. Um, one of the reasons Flint Beat was launched is because the residents asked for it. I was working for M Live Media Group at the time covering City Hall and we were in, in the middle of this water crisis. And so residents would talk to me, I'm from Flint, and so residents would talk to me about what was missing, like those news gaps. And they were pretty much tired of seeing crime, water crisis, and sports. <laughs> and so it was because of the community yeah. that I jumped out there without <laughs> thinking it through. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and launched Flint Beat. So I'm really grassroots community driven news. You find me at meetings that other news media, they don't attend um, or they're not even invited to. Uh, if you go through my Facebook page, uh, most of those people are residents and people from the community. And so I look at it that way, like this is a real grassroots effort 
that we do with Flint Beat. So um, I read in, a, in an article that in 2017, I think you raised $5,000 through advertising um, or something like that. Um, <laughs> I started a modest GoFundMe campaign and I raised just shy of $2,000. And again, since I'm community, 30% of our residents, they do not have internet access at home. Wow. And last year, we had this really big recall election. We had about 17 people running for mayor. Then we had about 17 people running for nine seats on the city council. And I produced a voter's guide, printed 5,000 copies, and we sell ads for that. OK, great. Um, and so. Chris runs the Devil Strip, um, which is also a nonprofit, um, and you made that decision fairly recently, I believe. Yeah, we're nonprofit-ish. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so tell us what nonprofit-ish means and why you went that route. Uh, I started as a for-profit. We've been around for three and a half years. We started uh, March 2015. Uh, wait. Yeah. I think. <laughs> Oh, you're a journalist, really not a mathematician, that. so, so it's okay. I appreciate that. I can't do that math. Um, so we started as a nonprofit, or as a for-profit because it'd be easier, uh, frankly, than mm -hmm. the paperwork that it would have required to be a 501c3 plus, uh, kind of like Jaquanda. I didn't think about it very much. I was just like, I wanted to do this thing and uh, just jumped right into it. Now, uh, after uh, getting to meet uh, Sue and uh, getting to hear some of the uh, mm -hmm. other nonprofits working in that field at uh, IRE, a conference uh, in Orlando mm -hmm. this year, I uh, thought, well, this would make sense to, to dabble in this space a little bit. Ultimately, what I want to do, though, uh, is be a community-owned cooperative. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I come from a, a, a part of Georgia, middle Georgia, uh, that's not exactly rural, but really close to a lot of rural stuff. And so they have these electrical utility co-ops uh, operating in these areas where for-profit companies never saw the financial incentive to go. And I look at our situation with news deserts in a very similar way. Now, I don't think we're going to get the kind of government support uh, that those utilities got. Uh, they got loans that they uh, were able to pay off. But uh, we also don't need quite as much because... Producing good local journalism doesn't cost as much as running cable and, and wire, uh, I hope. So uh, I'm pursuing that model, but in the, in the meantime, doing the nonprofit stuff to kind of get uh, a feel for what that looks like. So are you making money? Am I? <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 that's part of it. So, so who is making money as um, part we, of the devil's trip? We just, we, we've been sustainable-ish uh, since we started. So... Uh, you know, we're, 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 I mean, you know, it depends on, I'm not good at math. We've already established this. Um, so uh, to, to, to publish the first issue, we, you know, we used a little bit of our money. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot, but we used a little bit of our money. And then uh, I went and sold ads. Uh, it's actually kind of how I got into journalism was selling ads. And uh, so I knew how to do that. I hustled up some money. We started printing, hustled up more money, started printing more papers. Uh, and uh, been on that sort of uh, hamster wheel for a little while. Um, the, the fiscal agent that we use to kind of to be nonprofit-ish uh, allows us to take donations. So we've had some uh, funding support from a couple of local foundations uh, who, who allowed me to hire some people so that I could be here in this fellowship uh, and not trying to work remotely uh, serendipitously. Or not serendipitously. What's the word for no one notices? You're good. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm also not good at words. <laughs> so, uh, Jaquanda, of course, you laughed at the use of, sust what was the word you used? Sustainability. Sustainability. Ish. Yeah. Ish. Well, ish. Uh, yes. um, I, I imagine, I mean, so Flint Boots, you know, it's not even two years old. Uh, and uh, I imagine you're experiencing some of the same challenges. Yes. So, I started solo. So I was by myself, and when I first started, I left the newsroom. They made some announcement about what they wanted to do at that particular organization, and I wrote my resignation letter while they were having this meeting and uh, decided I was leaving and put in my two weeks. And my last day was March 10th, and Flint Beat officially launched on the 13th, that following Monday. Wow. For six months. I function like a journalist, like I'm covering City Hall, kicking butt, they're chasing me, you know, I'm <laughs> loving it. Six months into it, I'm like, 
I gotta pay my bills. <laughs> <laughs> like I didn't think this through. Like <laughs> the community, they're loving it, but they're not helping me with these bills. And so I had to pick up a day job. So up until this past September, I um, was still working a day job. Content suffered though. Mm -hmm. I couldn't cover the city like I usually cover. Like I'm a city hall girl. You know, yeah. I leave city hall, the mayor's calling me, council people are calling me, the residents are like, where are you at? Nobody's here. Even though we have one, two, three TV stations and mm -hmm. then a legacy newsroom. Wow. Nobody covers City Hall. And you weren't able to use freelancers? There were no money for freelancers or anything like Out that? Out of my pocket. Mm. Okay. So I had a young man. The, there's no journalism programs in Flint, and that was a big issue for me, to find writers mm -hmm. and freelancers and students that were interested and engaged in covering an area like Flint. And so I did find a young man. That's 19 year, he was 19 years old. Yeah. And he had launched his, he relaunched the newspaper at his high school, really smart young man, Andrew Roth. And so he covered politics. I can't find anybody to cover Flint City Hall though. He would do state politics with local angles because everybody was in the city of Flint because of the water crisis. Right. You know, um, that was fun. And then he ended up walking MSU, freshman, writing for the state news okay. after he worked for Flint B which is great, but I can't find. You can't replace it. So, <laughs> so I launched a journalism program. <laughs> <laughs> so I can start shaping young people <laughs> through journalism. <laughs> so I think right now we have 16 students. We launched July 9th and we received a grant. So I got a $75,000 grant for a program we call News Movement in Flint. And just starting again this, August, this October, we have 16 students. Are you working with high school students? They so are grades 6 through 12. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> it's different, but they are 6 through 12. <laughs> and I am working with a photographer, Mark Felix. He's an independent, so he does like um, New York Times, Wall Street Journal and whatnot. But we, when he came to Flint as an intern for M Live, I can't get rid of him. <laughs> And then um, another gentleman, Kofi Myler, he's a visual journalist. He came, he worked at the Free, but he's been doing journalism since elementary school. So he works with me and we have people come in and volunteer and whatnot with the kids and they're working on a big gun project right now with the Trace. Okay. Mm. And then after mm -hmm. that, they're gonna do a Flint water crisis project. But I had awesome. to re-engage the community in it. Um, Flint schools, they do not have a journalism program our local universities and colleges, they do not have journalism programs. Mm. And so it was see a need, fill a need. Yeah. So on top of what I was doing, working full time, trying to run Flint Beast, <laughs> I said, oh, let me teach young people. Just add, mm. so, add something yeah, else. Like, why not just add something else to my plate? Well, Make you, my you, kids participate in my program. You weren't doing enough, so. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, um, and Clay, so you have a different model. I mean, so, um, the Half Moon Bay Review was owned by a newspaper chain that decided to sell it, uh, and then several community members stepped up to buy it. So how did that come about? Can you give us some background on what happened just uh, in the spring? Yeah, so <clears throat> I was minding my own business. I was the editor of the Half Moon Bay Review and also the uh, editorial director for the parent company, which was WIC Communications in September of 2017. And one day the CEO called me up and said, hey, uh, Clay, funny story, we're gonna sell the Half Moon Bay Review. And I thought, well, okay, what does that mean? So there was about a month of just trying to figure out what that meant. And then it became sort of clear what that meant, which uh, when he, he said, there's these people who want to talk to you on the phone about the market. And there was a private equity firm in Wisconsin that you know, was wanting to know about the demographics and was it a tourism trade? And you know, it was clear there, was, there were no questions about journalism <laughs> that I was getting from these potential buyers. Mm. And so, so that was concerning. Um, and I, you know, I thought about writing one of those letters like Jaquanda wrote, uh, you know, <laughs> my resignation letter. Uh, I, uh, I didn't do that partly because I, I didn't have the gumption that she had to start my own thing. Um, but but what, uh, what I did, and frankly, I should give him credit, um, uh, Francis Wick, the uh, CEO of Wick Communications said, why don't you find a nonprofit to buy it, you know? And I thought, well, I, I don't know how to do that either. <laughs> Um, and there was no such nonprofit in existence in Happening Bay. 
So um, <clears throat> that was sort of the first bright idea. And, and, uh, and when I started to connect with uh, local people in the community who uh, I thought understood the value proposition of the local newspaper and their, their heads were in the right place and that they didn't see it as a, as a cash cow, uh, that was sort of the first thing that we, th that we thought mm -hmm. about was forming a nonprofit. And we had a uh, <clears throat> uh, interesting phone call with uh, some lawyers from a large uh, nonprofit in the Bay Area that uh, was was willing to be our fiscal sponsor, and it was a it was basically an hour and a half of what we couldn't do if we <laughs> if we accepted that arrangement, and so we thought, well, that doesn't seem very fun. We wouldn't be able to endorse uh, candidates, wouldn't be able to do uh, some of the sort of political things that we do now. So uh, yeah. so we so we didn't go that route. Um, so you, you formed a public benefit corporation, I believe. Explain for yeah. us what that is. Yeah, so, <clears throat> and I'll get over my head here pretty quick, but there's, um, uh, some people might be familiar with, with uh, B Corps, uh, benefit corporations. Well, a public benefit corporation is sort of like that. Uh, they exist in many states. Um, and the way it works in California is, uh, you, you essentially write into your bylaws that you, you don't simply exist to maximize shareholder value, but that you also exist for some community good. And, and we thought that was symbolic, um, both for the public, that they knew what we were up to, and also for people who might invest uh, mm -hmm. in, in the paper, so that they knew they wouldn't 10 years from now decide that, mm -hmm. they were, that this was a losing proposition and somebody should have told them. Yeah. So. Okay, so, so we keep hearing uh, you all talk about the community got involved, the community did this, the community did that. So who is the community when you talk about that? I mean, and let's start with Chris, um, because uh, you, know, you have a, uh, a magazine that's you know, for and about the community um, mm -hmm. in all aspects, apparently. Who do, how do you define community? Um, in a couple ways. So one, I want to steal from Dorico, who came and spoke to our JSK fellows. I just knocked over my water. Also, not good at physical space. Um, <laughs> but you're good at comedy. So. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it helps uh, with my wife. So um, community. We, we are already in community with each other, whether we recognize it or not, whether we want to admit it or not, whether we want to act like it or not. Uh, and so I think about that uh, as part of our mission, too. So even though we specifically serve communities inside of our geographic bounds, uh, and when, I, when I first moved to Akron, it was pretty obvious that these different sectors were all separated and siloed, uh, whether there's arts and business and nonprofit and all that good stuff. Uh, but also, so our neighborhoods were, too, are all siloed off. It was a product of a different time. And uh, wanted to bring these folks together. I uh, wanted to see them connect with each other, whether they were individuals or they were part of uh, these sectors and industries. So uh, I think about, okay, well, we're, we're all in this community together uh, in Akron. Uh, we all have sort of this big banner over us. We're Akronites. Uh, so how, how can we bring these folks uh, into community willingly uh, and not just staying in their little bubbles? And so that's how I think about it. So yeah, we serve uh, you know, a bunch of different sub-communities and subcultures and all this stuff, but we are, we're doing it with this goal of uh, a broader sense of community. So, okay, so now I want to turn to Jaquanda. How do you think about community? Because, I mean, you talk about getting phone calls from the mayor and everybody saying, you know, where are you? Uh, this sort of thing. Yeah, mine is easier. Yeah. Flint. Okay. <laughs> I'm hyper-local. I, I only think about the city of Flint and news that empowers, impacts, and informs uh, people in Flint. So outlining communities, I could care less. Uh, I, when I approach news, our tag is your community, your voice, your news. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not doing it from the state's voice. I could care less. And a lot of times, you know, I'm not even doing it from City Hall's voice. I'm first going to the residents um, to put those people in place to see how they feel and what they feel about issues, and that's what I'm there for. So it's it's really easy for me to define okay. community. So so actually, in a minute, Sue, I'm going to turn to you for your mm -hmm. take on that. But before we do that, I don't want to get, let this question get away from us. So we're what four years into the Flint water crisis, it's something like that. Yeah. Yes. Um, so what's going on? What's the state of things now? Because uh, we're all curious about Flint, right? And what's going on with the water? 
Well, thanks for asking. Uh, <laughs> uh, the city of Flint is still um, struggling with a water crisis. What most do not know is that it, it's really not a lead issue anymore. It's more of a medical issue, uh, bacteria. They, they deal with that um, ongoing skin conditions. Residents are still losing hair. But, you know, um, they tackled the lead as best that they could. They're still replacing the infrastructure. We do have some homes in the city of Flint that have high lead content. I just had a young lady speak at the Society of Environmental Journalists conference, and she said her levels are 78 parts per billion and federal guidelines 15. And this is four, more than four years later. Mm. And then also um, I had them speak with a young lady who had Legionnaire's disease. She survived, her name is Jasmine, and um, the health issues that she has after that mm. ordeal. So the city is still going through a lead crisis despite what you hear on some national news media outlets about the condition of the water. They still can't drink it. Okay, thank you for sharing. Um, so Sue, Let's talk mm -hmm. about this issue of community. So you represent, mm -hmm. you know, more than 180 news organizations, um, and all of those communities are different. Are there commonalities? Mm -hmm. Is it different everywhere? Can things be replicated? There's, uh, to give you a sense of the, the overall mix of those 180, it's now about 190, um, about half of them are local and that they're local or state. But the state is very different. So they cover the state government usually or statewide issues, and that's something um, that is falling to nonprofits increasingly. So they have a little different community. They may be followed by uh, policymakers or authorities, and they often distribute their content um, as Neil and Fernando described in partnership with these organizations that have bigger, uh, bigger audiences and bigger brands to begin with. And then about a third are national, and a third, uh, I would say the fastest growing ones, are single subjects. So they're expert reporters who cover health or cover social justice. Um, and I would even count um, Laquanda in one of those, be really being a specialist about water quality and these issues of the water supply. So you get these pockets of expertise. So I, I guess what that adds up to is they're quite varied. Um, what we're seeing is that the ones that are strong, and some of them are very small, and some of them are very well funded from the get-go, but the commonality in that is that they are, they are grassroots, they're growing out of the community, and so they are quite different. Um, they're covering what the community finds important and tells them is important. They do a lot of community engagement. Their mix of revenue varies. And so we don't see that classic kind of business pattern of, oh, we found it, it's a pilot, it works here, let's duplicate it everywhere across the country. What we think we're seeing emerging is a new kind of interaction between communities and the journalists that is tightly woven, it's highly customized, and then they're banding up through INN and other organizations to share resources, kind of connect with each other underneath. But right now, and I suspect for the next five years or so, they're going to be highly experimental and they may look a lot different from each other community to community um, because they are trying to tailor themselves to what people will support and need. So, Sue, how much growth are you seeing among these type of news organizations? We're, we're seeing very substantial growth. So they're tiny by standards of global media, right? So there's about 200 around the country, somewhere between 200 and 300. But the pace of growth is really astonishing. While you're seeing this decline in traditional media, they're growing more than 20% year over year. I mean, we're hearing from multiple communities or people launching these every week, and it, the pace is accelerating. Now, we'll see if a recession dampens that, but right now, they're growing very fast, and they are gaining financial stability. So one of the big questions in our mind is, if you are bootstrapping one of these, will they survive? And the answer is yes. It's a few really tough years, like you've heard about here, 
But these organizations, even the tiny ones that are bootstrapping themselves, are surviving. And after a few years, they really start to grow. They get a couple anchor grants. They find some local patrons. And the failure rate's under 10%, like considerably under 10%, which is um, not at all typical of startups, whether they're for profit or nonprofit. So something's really happening in this pace of growth, in this momentum. And it, it does give me great hope because I think you are seeing a new form created. So, Sue, uh, not to keep you in the spotlight, but uh, mm -hmm. to follow up on that. Mm -hmm. um, so, one of the things that's unique about INN, your organization, is that you have standards that organizations mm -hmm. have to meet to be a member of INN. So, all of these things that form aren't members of INN. Can you tell us mm -hmm. a little bit about the requirements and, and why you have those standards? Yeah, the, the requirements started back when the organization was founded about 10 years ago. It was founded by investigative journalists. And they required editorial independence, um, no advocacy, uh, no publications that were founded by a cause other than serving the public and the reader, and financial transparency. This is always a question mark that hangs really over all of journalism, but in a particular way around nonprofits. If somebody's funding you, are you beholden to them? Do they want to control the coverage? And so stating editorial independence is really important to the readers and to the funders. So they know if I'm giving you $100,000, I don't get to, I don't have any say in what you're reporting and that they know that up front. And so we do require financial transparency and for them to have published editorial independence policies. Um, increasingly, we hear from publications that are kind of in a gray area and that they are founded by advocacy organizations that are genuinely concerned about the lack of coverage of their issue, hire professional journalists. They're often doing outstanding work but they may have a mission that's broader than just informing the reader. And I think we're going to create a separate kind of category for them because they need support. There's nothing wrong or unethical with what they're doing. It's important, but it's different. And we think it's very important that readers know what's different. This issue of trust mm -hmm. um, is also becoming more important, right? People for that idea of that you have this bond and you know the news you trust and believe, whether you find it on Facebook or shared through another media form. So we see those standards actually becoming more important. Thank you. So let's tease out this issue of trust a little bit. I mean, because we're all, we're all dealing with, um, you know, news organizations that are rooted in the community. So Clay, um, especially with the model that you all have undertaken at the Half Moon Bay Review, have you seen an increase in community trust, a decline? Is that something that comes up in the conversations that you have with yeah. the public? <clears throat> I, I, couldn't, um, you know, I couldn't say our trust was at seven and now it's at 12. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I can tell you just anecdotally um, that everybody is, is very excited and supportive of what's going on at the Half Moon Bay Review. They, they like that it's owned by local, by local people like them. Um, you know, I am sure, and I have heard some people who think that the that the investors uh, are up to something that they they want to they have sort of an ego in this, and that they're trying to uh, promote their own values. Um, and I, what I say is, I guess the proof will be in the pudding. I mean, there's certainly no evidence of that so far. Um, and there was, you know, that was always an issue. Whoever owned the paper could right. have um, could have exerted that kind of an influence. So. Um, you know, pe people are excited about, about the possibilities and the fact that, it, that it's owned by people like them, for sure. Great. And Jaquanda, you seem, everybody seems to be trusting what you're doing. I mean, based on the feedback, you seem to be getting at all levels. Um, yeah, I'm like at 200% trust. <laughs> <laughs> the elected officials trust me, my residents trust me, other news agencies Trust me, they trust me enough to copy my stuff and do it verbatim, <laughs> even with the typo. Damn. So, and without um, giving you credit. Without giving me credit. Um, okay. Like just recently, I broke a story about an NAACP vice president deciding he was not going to support a Democratic candidate because she's gay. I, I had two news agencies call me that morning to 
get my story, you know, whatever. Uh, tapping me for sources. I had news agencies send me scripts so I can read them over before they air stuff on TV and whatnot. But they trust me. Okay. And it's important mm -hmm. for me, for the residents to trust me, for them to know that I'll do a nice three-part series on the mayor, but I'll also a write when she tries to put a PPO out against a man trying to recall her. That's bull crap. Okay. Like, I'm, I'm not judging anybody. I'm just doing my job. I'm just reporting. No personal agenda at all. But I have opinions, but I just keep them to myself. You know, um, and that's what I'm there for. Great. Okay. So, um, our so. comedian. <laughs> so, uh, what about Akron um, and trust? Um, I, it sounds very familiar. Yeah. To, it, it will sound familiar. Uh, I don't know if we're at 200% trust. We're working on it. <laughs> um, I, I think about like why we need trust, right? It's because we evolved to be social, and this is how we interact with each other. Uh, if I don't trust you, uh, I won't do business with you, so to speak. And so that, that trust is mightily important. Um, we got a lot of trust out of doing a series of stories on uh, the University of Akron and uh, a president there who was doing some stuff that uh, was shady, um, including trying to buy uh, the ITT Tech uh, chain of for-profit uh, schools that is now out of business. Uh, uh, anyway, um, I think when people know you're on their side, they'll trust you. Right. And like you said, proof is in the pudding, you know? So if you're, if you're doing the work, I mean, we, I don't think we have an agenda, but we definitely have a bias. We have a very pro Akron bias. And so we, we work through a lens of like, what's going to be good for this community. Uh, not that we're the ultimate arbiters either. Like we take that feedback. Uh, and so I think that's why we have trust. I think we have trust because we've demonstrated that we're doing this uh, because we, we love this city. So one of the things that I think stands out to me um, as I talk to you three who are directly involved in a particular news organizations is that you all actually embody elements of trust in your communities, I think. So mm -hmm. I'm very curious about your role, um, when you got started, how it's evolved, and Chris, of course, now you're here. Um, can you just talk about that? Um, you know, you were, you, know, you moved from Macon to Akron, mm -hmm. um, adopted that as your community, um, and now you're here. Um, so t take us through that process about what you mean to Akron and Akron means to you. Uh, well, I don't, I don't know if I've actually told you this, but um, there was, it was a good week or two where I didn't want to take the fellowship if it were offered. Um, like, it, it, the, the community means that much to me. My life in Akron means that much to me. Uh, and the idea of spending that much time away uh, for a while was really hard to swallow. Um, the weather has made up for that. Um, <laughs> uh, ultimately, what it was was I, I realized I would be able to do more good uh, for Akron after being here and getting to do things like this and, and meet the kind of people that I'm in the fellowship with and the people that the fellowship brings me in contact with. Um, my role, uh, I, I realize, uh, I've mentioned all the things I'm not good at. One of the things I'm not good at is understanding my limitations. And so when we started, um, I did everything that I could possibly do. I tried to learn InDesign, I sucked at that, so I got a graphic designer. Uh, but other than that, I was just like doing all this stuff. Fortunately, other people saw what we were doing and came in and joined the platform, right? And it became a vehicle. The magazine became a vehicle for people in the community to contribute. Uh, and even though Akron doesn't have a journalism program, we found people who were close enough to good at this and we could groom them. We have an ethos and they followed it and it, it started really working out. And so what's happened, my role has really been just sort of to elevate other people's voices at this point. Uh, and that was another reason why I felt comfortable coming here yeah. was that, you know, we could bring in more people and we could, we could strengthen the platform and it could be a better vehicle for more people to get their, their view of Akron out there. And I don't mean like opinion pieces, not op-eds, I mean like real work, uh, but now I'm rambling. So, oh, so you're good. Yeah. Okay, uh, and Clay, so you were editor before the community group bought the Half Moon, Boo, uh, the Half Moon Bay Review. Uh, you've been there um, for a while. Has your role changed at all? Do you see it evolving? Well, I think so. Um, you know, probably most people here have been to Half Moon Bay. Uh, it's a very particular place. Um, uh, part, part of the reason why what we did works, I think, is because 
uh, because it's not Burlingame and it's not Menlo Park. It's mm -hmm. there's some nobody ends up in Happen Bay by accident. You know, it's a, it's a <laughs> you go there with an intent, and um, and and so to to kind of bring that around to your question, I think you know part part of my role has shifted a little bit in terms of uh, evenings like this. Or last week, I spoke to the Odd Fellows Hall and. People are more interested to know what what we're doing, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that Happen Bay was in real serious financial straits, um, and and the you know I don't think it's going too far to say that the newspaper was uh, literally one of the pillars of the community, uh, holding kind of the glue of the thing together, and so I think you know it uh, it is it, it my role has sort of evolved a little bit to be. Not so much, you know, uh, lower casing all the things that people bring in in capital letters, uh, to to more sort of speaking uh, for the community and things like this. So, are you sort of the representative of the owners to the community? Is that the way it works? Um, to some degree, there's also a managing partner uh, who also represents the owners, but um, that's fair. Okay, great. Um, and so, and Sue, now you run this mm -hmm. collaborative now, um, but. Earlier in your career, you were mm -hmm. managing new media ventures within the Associated Press. Mm -hmm. So I'm very interested in that transition for you um, from being inside, you know, this 100-plus-year-old uh, organization mm -hmm. trying to start something new to actually being on the leading edge of some of what's happening mm -hmm. in news in America. It's um, there are similarities and differences. The the similarities. Um, are the passion of the journalists, which I think is true across traditional media and new media. Um, the, the, the dedication in newsrooms runs really deep. People do this out of, out of a love of their communities and their country, and, and that really does motivate them, our very traditional kind of patriotic values in a way, even if they're watchdog, tough reporters. Um, the differences that we're seeing from traditional media to these startups, though, are interesting. Um, the AP is a, is a global organization and is pretty nimble, which is why it's survived where others haven't. But still, when you have these large organizations with large boards, they can't turn the ship that quick. And they do have that classic innovator's dilemma of the bulk of their funding coming from things that they know are going away. And what is so striking with these little organizations is that they can take a lot of risk really quick, and they do. They've, and they also, if something doesn't work, they're not wed to it. They drop it in a minute, and they say, oh, God, that didn't work at all. We're going to try something else. So they'll just be very frank about what doesn't work. And so they are very nimble, and they're well suited to experimenting. Um, you know, the medium size of these things, half of them have a staff of eight or under, and then half are eight or more, including some that are up above 100 staffers. But that's up at the top, like ProPublica and, and um, Reveal and Center for Investigative Reporting. Most of them are very small. Um, and so they, they're very flexible, and they're trying to figure it out as they go. And... Um, it's that risk taking that I see as being different and that community connection. Okay, thank you. Um, and so your organization is really based on a collaborative model yeah. to a large extent. We're, the, the way we think of it, you know, I used to talk about this as grassroots journalism and um, I got a lesson in botany that actually was quite useful from a woman named uh, Heather Chaplin at the New School in New York and she said what What's really happening in the startup world is you are rhizomes, which I had to go look up, <laughs> and it's like a forest of bamboo. So if you're a if you're a little grassroots, you know you can be squashed or you you shrivel in the heat really easily. And all this connective stuff that's being built underneath through INN and a few similar organizations, they're all linked together, and they are building a new ecosystem. And that is in partnership with for-profits as well. But it gives them, I think that's also part of the resilience and strength. So I now think of them as a field of bamboo. 
if you've ever grown bamboo because it grows here, you know it's like impossible to kill, right? Yeah. You pull up one blade, it's not going anywhere. So that's what's happening. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so Jaquanda, you're part of this of the rhizomes that are shooting <laughs> yes. uh, all under the ground. So, so how has that been to your benefit? Um, so with Flint B, when I started, I didn't think about for-profit, non-profit. Again, I thought mm -hmm. news. Um, I find that being part of an institute like INN, we do uh, proposals for projects. You know, I, I, I didn't think about it until I started talking to people from INN, it was too. Also Knight Foundation, Democracy Fund, Jason Alcorn. You know, they just started having these talks with me at um, the ONA. So I'm a member of ONA, and so I was at ONA, and, uh, Online uh, uh, News Association. Yeah. And so I'm at ONA September of 2017, and I'm doing one of those talks, and Jason Alcorn happens to be at this table. He's with the Democracy Fund. And so he just starts talking to me about this nonprofit model, and maybe I should think about it. Then I bump into Karen Runtlett from the Knight Foundation, and she's having the same conversation with me. And so I started to think about it differently, like what is out there so far support for journalism mm -hmm. that's boots on the ground in communities like Flint that will support the work that we're doing. And I got a fiscal sponsor. It happens to be the community center where I teach the youth journalism program. This is before I even launched the program, though. And so we're brick and mortar because we have an office in there, and I run this program and everything. And they started to teach me grant writing. Hmm. So I was like, oh, this is cool, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'd rather write a grant than sell an ad. That's just how I feel about it. And so I started to write proposals, and we got funding to build our revenue model through Lion Publishers, through Democracy Fund, with some money that they came up with for a mentorship program called RAMP. And then I also received funding with the Solutions Journalism Network um, for a gun violence project that we're working on. So when I just started to think about the work that we do differently, doors started to open in a way that I didn't even anticipate them opening. I thought I would be trying to sell an ad here and there and getting money that way. But things just started to change really fast. So I think we started applying for things in April. No, it had to be March. Uh, of March this year? Of or this year. Okay. And so now I think, so Lion was 70, I'm really transparent about money, I don't care. So Lion was $7,500, then Solutions gave us $5,000, then someone else who supports my work gave us $10,000, then I got a $75,000 grant for the youth program. Mm -hmm. This is less than a year. And it's just thinking about this as a public service. You know, I wasn't making cold calls, I wasn't trying to put together marketing plans and ad packages for people, I just, sat down and started writing my butt off, like what I already do, yeah. saying the work that I do, you should support it because you have the money and this is what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, I did um, start separating myself for some things. Like now, I mentioned Kofi Myler earlier. We're partnered now and we're shaping some things under a company that's called Brown Impact Media. And what Brown Impact Media Group does is we're aiming to launch news outlets in underserved communities mm -hmm starting with Flint Beat. Okay. And so we're already thinking mm -hmm. about other products in other areas where they can use the same type of journalism that we're doing in the city of Flint. So he's in Detroit, you know, and so he's working on learning grant writing and writing proposals and those opportunities out there that support this work where I'm not, where I don't have my site with all these ads from car dealerships and, you know, pop-ups yeah. and, Things like that. I just want people to get the news. Just get be able to get to this news that we're doing here. You know. Oh, that's awesome. So, thank you. Uh, and while I, I'll get questions from the audience, Clay, are there any collaborative efforts that you're undertaking in Half Moon Bay? Uh, yes. So, uh, also, I've been very interested in the Solutions Journalism Network. Um, we've had a couple of uh, training sessions with them. Um, we also partner with uh, Cal Matters, which is a fancy way of saying we print their stuff. 
Uh, so we, uh, which is a new thing for us because mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we've always defined our community very uh, in a geographically very precise way, but we've, you know, we have discovered uh, after low after 120 years that our our problems are all of our problems. I mean, whether it's housing and homelessness and mm -hmm. traffic are regional things, and uh, it kind of doesn't make sense to just stop those things at, at the border. So. Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, you know, and I'm about six months behind uh, Jaquanda and Chris in terms of uh, writing grants and, and looking for other things, so. Okay, great. Um, so now we'll turn to some of your questions. And uh, I'll throw this to the group, but uh, I think I'll turn to Jaquanda first because you um, hinted at this. Uh, well, no, you addressed it directly, actually. Um, could mm -hmm. nonprofits be providers to regional or national newspapers and make money? Great question. Um, I mentioned the $10,000, and that's through Sarah Alvarez from Outlier Media. And the, the big thing, I think, with independent publishing is to be able to collaborate and provide content to some of those legacy newsrooms. We're there. We're in the communities. I look up, and the New York Times, they're sending freelancers, you know, to my community to cover the water crisis. You can get content from me. So we are collaborating and working to provide products and content to other newsrooms outside of our communities. So we've, me, Sarah and I just recently did a um, water rate story together. Okay. So we're gonna see what happens there. And someone, they purchased it and we're gonna see what happens. And, and I'll give a shout out to Sarah Alvarez. Um, she is a, another JSK fellow working in the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. Um, trying to serve that community, uh, mostly through the delivery of text messaging around housing and utility issues. So a, a huge shout out to Sarah. Um, so uh, Chris, is that a model that you've tried at all in Akron? Have you tried providing? Making money? Well. <laughs> I haven't tried that yet. Um, <clears throat> so we, all of our collaborations are uh, to amplify the work right now. Um, I've seen situations like you're talking about where people spend money sending reporters in where we might have been able to help. Um, but that wasn't a part of our model, so I can't blame anybody who's done that. Um, I, I, I can see it being something that could you know, be a revenue stream. I don't think it'd be a big enough one to, to really invest much in. Uh, otherwise, I just like doing the collaborations because it gives us uh, not more reach, but more experience. So we're working with public media uh, in the Akron area to do uh, some series of stories where we do mm -hmm. print and online and they have uh, the audio stuff uh, because we don't know what the heck we're doing. Okay. And that was the censored version. Uh, Sue, do you see other members of INN um, doing this sort of model? Yeah, there, there is a lot of distribution. There's a lot of content sharing. The majority, like three quarters of our members do share content mm -hmm. or provide it under a Creative Commons license, which is a little different than copyright. It basically says, you can use this. Um, some of them get paid for that. Many of them will distribute for free because they're trying to establish their brand. They're trying to help the audience discover them. And I think a good example of that came up earlier when, when you all showed your hands on who knows Cal Matters. Cal Matters is sharing content with many, many newspapers, all the big public media in the state. And so it's a little bit of a dilemma for them. They're getting huge reach. Their journalism has huge impact. Their funders fund them to provide that. But if they ultimately have to get readers su to support them, do they then get these other for-profit media to chip in for that coverage? Or do they try to get that, hope that it builds enough of an audience they can support themselves? So there's a lot of um, kind of strategic thinking and experimenting around that. In some states, the nonprofits don't distribute unless they're paid somewhat, and they may have less foundation funding. And then some that have strong foundation funding or individual funding will share it freely. So I think that's a moving okay. target. It's within their mission, but they'll have to be sustainable over time. Okay. So we actually, we have a, another very interesting question, which um, Sue, I'm also going to direct this to you because you probably have more experience with this. Uh, <coughs> the Sonoma West Publishing Company, a very small local operation, mm -hmm. did a direct public offering to raise money. Um, this person invested after reading an article about it in the New York Times. 
Um, do you have an opinion on this model? And um, I think the Ber I think Berkeley side also. Berkeley side that. also has done yeah. that. Yeah, I I think it's fine. <laughs> um, I think communities again, as long as they have editorial independence, you know, you don't get to, you know, doctor that headline or change how they report something. The community investing in its its local publications, like Half Moon or Sonoma, or through donations to nonprofits, I think that can all be healthy. You, you know, if I, if I could jump in. So the publisher of Sonoma West is Raleigh Atkinson. Uh, he said that he, one, uh, the only reason I want to interject is the, the, still the power of legacy media. Uh, yeah. He uh, wanted to raise $400,000 through the DPO and he, he had 100,000. And then the New York Times did a story about him, mm. and a week later he had 200,000. <laughs> so, including people from all over the country who just wanted to contribute to what, what he had done. Okay. Just, can uh, I jump in on that? Yes, please. Um, so, I'm curious why not a co op in that situation? Uh, I hope to ask them this. Uh, direct public offering, if you're not familiar, means that you could all be shareholders in it. Uh, the community-owned co-op model that I'm working on would also involve control. Uh, mm -hmm. You would get to vote on certain things. You know, uh, you get to represent your community on a board of trustees, uh, and so there'd be more access uh, to guide the direction of the organization. So uh, I think it's great. I think that the nonprofits are great. I'm just curious why, in those situations, they didn't go whole hog. Uh, and, and just give the community the chance because I feel like the community deserves to own the media that covers it. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, we're out of time. Oh, um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, uh, but we're going to have to leave it there. Um, thank you very much for being with us this evening. My bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again so much for joining us tonight for a really important conversation about the state of local news. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about the Misinformation Society. With the midterm elections looming uh, and a deluge of information flooding the internet and the airwaves, how do we make sense out of it all? Please join me in a warm round of applause for all of our speakers tonight. <laughs>